Okay. So, Assalamu alaikum. Um, let's go ahead and start uh, today. But I just want to make a couple of announcements before I. Okay. So, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning. Uh, let's go ahead and start the second day. I just want to, to make a couple of announcements before I turn the a stage to our moderator, Dr. Nafisa Abdul Hafiz, who is a consultant medical oncologist at the Department of Oncology National Guard. But you know, the couple of announcements is very important. Please to uh, to to pay attention to the fact that we have three workshops after the lunch break. It's very critical that you sign in. You know, for the for the certificate and uh, the CME. So you sign in for the workshops. You'll be divided into groups based on the uh, uh, you know the the thing the color the color thing you have on your badge, and then uh, they will be post test as we did uh, yesterday pre test. They will be exactly the same uh, exam as post test, and we'll be seeing the differences in performance to assess the the impact of the educational activity we have done. Um, and then at that time, we'll be also giving you course evaluation, which is one page to give uh, your feedback. So the, 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 it is very important and required that you give us the course evaluation to get the CME. Okay, thank you very much. And now to Dr. Nafisa. Assalamu alaikum, good morning. Uh, my pleasure to start the first session for today and to introduce Dr. Ofar Khayal. Dr. Ofar is a consultant of breast surgeon and uh, endocrine, and she is uh, working at King, uh, King Faisal uh, University Hospital. Uh, Dr. Ofar will talk to us about um, sorry, point of care cancer resources. Dr. Ofar, please. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Ofa, talk about the epidemiology of breast cancer, clinical presentation of breast cancer, and where it comes. Good morning, everyone, on a Saturday. Um, I appreciate everybody actually woke up on a Saturday to come. Um, can I ask a question? Um, how many here are primary health care physicians? Um, how many here are internal medicine physicians? How many here are nursing? Um, and the rest who didn't lift up their hands, what are you? So just so you, huh? Surgeon. Surgeon, perfect. <laughs> how many work in the um, uh, Ministry of Health? Uh, private? Sector? Okay, good. Um, I always like to know who are my uh, audience so that I could actually gauge in terms of the um, uh, uh, discussion. So I am going to talk about epidemiology of breast cancer as well as a clinical presentation of breast cancer and workup. Um, technically, I'm not going to give you too many... Um, doesn't matter. It's not working. Okay. Uh, Sure. I'm working. Okay. Sorry. It's always like this. So anyway, I'm going to talk about um, the epidemiology of uh, the epidemi the review of epidemiology of breast cancer. I'll talk about globally, and then I'm going to talk specifically in Saudi Arabia. Um, what I'm going to do is after that give you case scenarios. I'm going to go and talk about it. I like it to be interactive. Um, it's um, some of it is going to be very straightforward. Breast is actually very straightforward. So, um, first of all, I bet you've had a lot of the statistics from yesterday. Um, this is the systemat systematic analysis from 1990 to 216 of the global burden of disease. And as you can see, the orange is um, breast cancer, and you can see that it's a burden usually from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 60s, and then it, it dips down. But here, this is the incidence. Here, when you look at the mortality, globally, it is always higher in younger age, and then it dips down. This, now, when you look at, again, breast cancer is the most common cancer worldwide. Okay, here it is. This is the incidence, the blue. And of course, the mortality here is the second highest after lung. 
Now, in Saudi Arabia, this is the latest from the Globocon 200, uh, 2018. As you can see, in terms of the incidence here, it is the number one cancer. When you look at the mortality, it's higher than lung. And of course, the five years prevalence is 29%. Now, the latest statistics show that we are increasing 5% yearly, according to the GCC. Now, here I did this um, comparison. I, I wanted to show you this comparison between the United States as well as Saudi Arabia. As you can see, the incidence of cancer in the States is very high, but the mortality in proportion is low. It's about 6% mortality. When you look at Saudi Arabia, the incidence isn't as high, but when you look at the mortality, it's about 27% mortality in terms of the proportion. So we have higher cancer deaths due to breast cancer. And the reason is we're diagnosing them late. 50% are diagnosed late. And this is a problem. So it is imperative that our healthcare professionals are aware. Um, a lot of times we have a mis misconception that you should be above the age of 50. Now, the statistics have shown that breast cancer here, 30% to 40, depending on where you read, are under the age of 40. So when you get a patient that in her late 20s or 30s and has a breast mass, you really should take it and follow worldwide the triple assessment. And we all know what the triple assessment is. Clinical exam, radi radiological exam, plus biopsy. So this leads us to our case scenario. Huda. Hood is a 23-year-old woman with a breast mass. Everybody was going to take a history. She has a four-month history. She has no pain, no skin changes, nipple discharge. It may have increased slightly. She doesn't know. And it doesn't change with menstrual cycles. Now, when you look at the, permanent, the pertinent past medical history as well as the gynecological history, this is your risk assessment history. This is where you want to see, is she a low risk or is she a high risk? So you look, she's healthy, she exercises regularly, she doesn't have any prior surgeries, no previous uh, biopsies, menarche 12, no pregnancies, regular cycle, she's just using oral contraceptives for the last two years, she's not smoking and doesn't do any alcohol. Her family history is a maternal grandmother with breast cancer at the age of 70. Is this significant? Does this make her at increased risk? Not really, yes, no, that's not a significant family history. So when you look at a physical examination, you look at symmetrical, you look at the breast, you see any skin changes, you see that you examine always the right, the, the breast that is not, uh, she's coming with left breast, you always examine the next breast. You get to feel, you feel for the tissue, you get to understand the normal breast, how it feels, and then you move to the one where she has the complaint with. Then you examine the left breast, you find a two centimeter well circumcised mobile mass, and usually it's nice to put it at, at what a clock position, seven position, is, and where is it in relation to the nipple areola? And this is near the areola margin. And of course, you examine the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, you examine the axilla, and according to the medical oncologists who always say to the surgeons, you never examine the supraclavicle. And yes, we never examine, because for us as surgeons, we only care about the axilla. But medical oncologist cares about the supraclavicular. But anyway, so we always have to examine the supraclavicular nodes as well as cervical nodes. Now, what is our differential on a 23-year-old low risk with a breast mask? Anyone? Takers? Fibroadenoma, a fibrocystic mass, cyst. And of course, you always have to have breast cancer at the back of your mind. So here is our physical, our history done. Now, would you get any laboratory for her? No? Yes? Who says no? Who says yes? Huh? I said laboratory. Would you get any laboratory? Uh, yes? We can, can, not related. Usually, if you're going to go, if you're thinking surgery, you could, but even biopsy, there is a little, depending where you are. In the private, they make you get CBC and PTT, and you know, you, you think, why am I getting this? This is just taking money because it's not really indicated in a low risk history patient, okay? Um, so there's no labs indicated. Patients has no clinical signs of any infection or nipple discharge, or nothing suggestion of any uh, systemic disease. Now, 
What are the further studies you would want at this time? Would you ask for a breast ultrasound, a screening mammogram, a diagnostic mammogram, an X-ray chest, CT, PET scan, or breast MRI? Breast ultrasound. Who would get an MR uh, mammogram? Good. Thank you. Because I've seen 20-year-olds getting mammograms for I don't know why, because they get mammograms. So yes, breast ultrasound is. And here is the finding of the breast ultrasound. So as you can see, and, and try to get in the habit, if you can see the images, is to look at the images to look at it with the report. Because sometimes getting um, exp your eye experience with the images, you actually end up being able to pick it up yourself and looking at it. And it's a good practice, if you have time, to look at the images. So this, as you can see, is a well-defined hypoechoic mass, looks completely benign, going with a fiber adenoma. What next? Would you do additional images? Some people would do a mammogram, and this is a mammogram. This mammogram is like white, dense. It proves and shows nothing in a 23-year-old. What next? So now you have imaging. It's benign. Would you do biopsy? Would you observe? Biopsy. Okay. So this is a discussion I've had with a, another person. Would you biopsy? Either? Yes, you would. But observation is also reasonable in a young patient with low risk history and benign appearance on images. However, the follow-up is very important. You need to see the patient every six months with serial ultrasound for two years with intervention if there's any clinical concern. That is, if it's increasing in size or if there's any change, okay? Now that can be reasonable. However, my reflex is I may think about doing a biopsy. Now, what are the different types of biopsies we all know? We know there is FNA and we have the core biopsy and we have excisional biopsy. Would you take this patient for an excisional biopsy? No, no? Yes. No, no, you would not. Never, we should not take a patient to diagnose her to the OR. This used to be the gold standard a long time ago before radiology got better at diagnosing and doing it with their FNAs and core biopsies. We usually do not take a patient to diagnose her to do excisional biopsy. Believe it or not, it still happens. We still have it. Um, if you do not have a core biopsy, then do an FNA. At least it gives you some uh, information. So I kind of wanted to know between FNA and, and a core biopsy, which do you prefer? Core biopsy. So I wanted to look at that and I wanted to give you the diagnostic value of FNA. It's pretty good. FNA is actually pretty good when you look at its sensitivity. Its specificity, there's some studies reported at 70, 70, 77.4. Some studies have shown an accuracy of always in the 70s and 80s. One study showed it in the 92. So it's a pretty good. But the thing about FNA is you need a, a good cytopathologist and you can miss it. But in, in a place where there isn't a core biopsy, it may be the first to do, and it, and it gives you some information, at least what type of cells it is. But if you have a core needle biopsy, that is the gold standard. I mean, I would say it is the gold standard now because it gives you tissue. It could tell you if this is, uh, uh, for example, uh, cancer, if it's um, in situ or if it's invasive. Now its accuracy has been reported up to the 80s. Um, it's sensitivity and specificity is always in the 90s. Um, and so it's a, a core biopsy is for me, at least I'm partial to the core biopsy. Um, and here is a very nice slide that shows a comparison between them. And I don't know if you can see, but it, it, you can tell mostly about the tumor grade, the lymphovascular invasion, the ER, PR, uh, which is the estrogen and, uh, um, and progesterone and HER2 receptors, which is very important for management. So in terms of the information, we all know that the core biopsy gives you more than the fine needle aspiration. But again, if you don't have a core biopsy in your, in, in your, in your place, then an FNA, you start with an FNA. Now here's an ultrasound guided core biopsy picture, as you can see, and our previous case, Huda, her final pathology was fiber adenoma. Would you intervene at this point for a 1.8 centimeter fiber adenoma? Would you excise or would you observe? Usually we would observe. Indications for excision would be if there's any rapid growth or in the report if you get, which is a really, I, I hate this one, 
fibro epithelial lesion cannot rule out phylloids. Um, and uh, that's when you actually have to go in and do an excisional biopsy. Um, and of course, patient preference. Usually I have a lot of patients who come in and say, I have, this causes me pain. No, this does not cause you pain. The tissue surrounding your fiber adenoma is sensitive. If you remove the fiber adenoma thinking it will reduce the pain, sometimes they end up having that pain. So you have to warn them if you're gonna take it out that the pain may still be there, that's one. Two, they may develop another one. And I always say, do you want me to create a map in your, in your breast that I will be doing excision, excision every time? So I tend to have this thing that three centimeters and above, yes, I will remove it for you. But otherwise than that, anything lower than three, I tend to want to observe it. Now, alternatively, what if this mass was more tender and developed acutely since her last period? This is the ultrasound, what do you think? The cyst, it's a breast cyst, it's a simple breast cyst. So differential diagnosis is a simple cyst. It's not, I mean, I put complex, but really it's not a complex because we don't see any of the um, hypoechoic lesions. So would you intervene at this point? I assist. Not really. If it's not causing any symptoms, you just leave it, just repeat the ultrasound in six months and then follow it up. Now, another case, this is Fatma. She's a 46 year old woman. She's seen by a gynecologist with an evaluation of a breast mass. Three weeks history, non-tender, denies any pain, no previous mammogram. She's healthy, married, has uh, four children, first pregnancy 21, she breastfed. This is all good in terms of risk assessment. Menarche age 11, OCP is 20 years total. She denies smoking, no alcohol, no drugs. This is her family history. Maternal grandmother with breast cancer is 62, maternal grandfather colon cancer, mother and sister with breast cancer at the age of 52 and 47, and two maternal aunts with ovarian and one maternal uncle with colon. Now, I, I did this on, on purpose. This is a significant family history, okay? So this patient to you, as you see this history, she's high risk. So in your mind, even from this, you are gonna say cancer until proven otherwise. Physical examination, of course, you see a left breast mass. There's a two centimeter firm mass. There's ill-defined at 12 o'clock and it's not tender. There is no axillary or supraclavicular nodes. What would you get? Would you get a screening or diagnostic? Is there a difference between them? Yes. Huh? Diagnostic, yes. A diagnostic mammogram is different than a screening. And, and this is something my radiology colleagues always want to say, do not order a screening mammogram for someone that has a finding because it's different. Diagnostic, and always when you're writing your form to the radiologist, inform them, communicate with them. One of the issues about miscommunication is, is detrimental between us in terms of we do not communicate with our radiology, telling them what we're seeing and what we're feeling. We just say, go for a mammogram. We don't even tell them where it is, where it is. So a clinical history is very important to the radiologist because then they can focus on their images where you're feeling your concern, okay? So that is important. Um, so yes, you get a diagnostic mammogram. Would you ask for something else in the interest of Additional ultrasound, exactly. You, you do both. You do, you actually would ask for it because she has a mass, she's not going for screen, so you want both. So, usually, the radiologist and would do the diagnostic mammogram. If they see anything else, they would ultrasound the other thing and your index mass. mass. So, this is the mammogram finding. As you can see, it's an index lesion. As you can see, it's speculated, it's highly suspicious. This is the ultrasound. It is irregular, there is posterior acoustic shadowing and um, irregular margins. Now, I have to tell you an example of this. I got an image is something that looked, because I get, I'm in the habit of reading them. Um, I had a radiologist uh, say that this uh, mass was completely benign or said, oh, we don't know, just ask for an MRI. To me, it looked completely suspicious. It did not need an MRI, it needed a biopsy. So that's why I always say, get the habit of looking at your images because you yourself can sometimes um, uh, guide and have a discussion with the radiologist. So the differential diagnosis of breast cancer. Of course, fibrocystic mass, unlikely. Fat necrosis, unlikely. Radial scar, it could be. So what would next? Would you do additional images? Would you observe? Would you do a biopsy? Would you refer to a specialist? Hmm? refer and biopsy. But technically, I would refer. 
um, refer to the specialist. Now, the thing and why am I saying I, I would do both biopsy and refer because by the time you get your appointment to the specialist, you already gotten the diagnosis. So do it both at that stage, refer because you know how appointments are to a specialist, it'll take a long time. Um, now, what if your patient is a 41 year old female, six week history of generalized fullness of her right breast and skin dimpling? Exam demonstrates a five centimeter irregular fixed right breast mass with skin dimpling and palpable right axillary nodes. This is the picture. You can see clearly, this is the skin dimpling and nipple retraction. This is her imaging, very big mass speculated with the lymph nodes clearly positive. So we've done the triple assessment, we did the bi biopsy, it's invasive lobular carcinoma. Okay, and the FNA of the axillary node is metastatic lobular carcinoma. If your patient, again, is a two-month history, she has fullness, left breast, there's erythema and skin dimpling. Would you treat this as an infection? No. Why? Sorry, I'm trying to go back. Uh, oops, sorry. I'm sorry, this is, uh, yes. Could you put this one? And then up, and one more, up, here. You have to look at the lactating history. Is the patient lactating? She's 47, okay? And if she was lactating, then you may think, okay, that she um, um, has some infection, but please, even in breast cancer, uh, in, in bre um, patients who are lactating or pregnant, don't discard the breast masses because they've, it's very common to happen in lactation uh, period where we think that it's a, a, a um, we don't work them up. We say, oh, here, take antibiotics. You can start with that, see your patient after a week, and if she hasn't responded, then you have to escalate it. So as I said, this is clearly showing the uh, retraction here at the lower, uh, this one here. So this is inflammatory breast cancer, and as well as the skin biopsy, we show tumor infiltration of the dermal lymphatics. Now, if a patient presents with one year history of recurrent scaling of the right nipple areola complex, there's no discharge. She's tried creams without relief. Would you tell her go to a dermatologist? Huh? This is your examination. I've given you the two worst. The first one here, as you can see, it's the scaling rash. This one, it's completely destroyed the nipple areola. Core biopsy showed invasive ductal carcinoma, and the skin biopsy of the nipple showed Paget's disease. Um, I'll give you an example. A 34-year-old female comes to me with a history of her nipples uh, itching, nipple changes uh, with an ulcer that's been already healed and there's a blackish scab for four months. Would you tell her to go or tell her to go to the uh, dermatologist? She went to the dermatologist. She actually in that interim had IVF, which uh, failed. But when I, she came to see me, I think someone told her to come and see me because of the nipple. I saw the nipple, there was a scab. I palpated, there was about a, literally maybe an eight cent millimeter, literally that small under the areola, a little mass, very superficial. We biopsied it, it was invasive ductal, strongly HER2 positive cancer. And then when I biopsied the nipple, it was Paget's disease. So in the end of the day, um, don't discard any images or any, sorry, any symptoms in the breast. I'm not making you like, oh, but you have to do the triple assessment. Don't say, go, you're too young, you can't have it. And she had no family history. Blow up after the menstrual cycle. Now, if they come to you with a breast lump that enlarges or is fixed or hard or other breast problems, please refer immediately to the next level. If the patient presents with A, which is just a breast lump, and her risk assessment shows that she has significant risk for breast cancer, or as we said, enlarges or fixed mass, 
or any other or any other findings on the breast, please refer to the next level. If they're under the age of 30, if they're above the age of 30 and they present with any of the other symptoms, I said from breast lump to fixed lump to have that, refer to the next level. Thank you. And if you have any questions, this is my email. You can always send me an email. Thank you. What, what are the options in uh, risk reduction in form of chemo prevention and risk reduction strategies? And then we'll have a conclusion. Okay, why do you need to do the risk assessment? First, when a patient comes to you in a clinic asking for risk breast counsel, you need to know when do you need to start screening and which modality that you use, and then can you modify her risk factor or no? So. When we divide the risk, the breast risk factor, we divide them into classical fact. Afon. Okay, classical risk factor. These are the ones that you obtain during a patient interview, age, um, age of menarche, age of first term, uh, full term <laughs> delivery. Uh, did she lactate or no? And then the breast density which you obtain during mammogram it's like a triple assessment consider it so this you obtain through the history taking this is the mammogram and then this what makes her high risk from pathological point of view and then we have extra bonus is the genetic risk so the classical risk factor age gender family history estrogen exposure which is exogenous endogenous lifestyle option and uh, exposure to uh, mantle radiation uh, the family history very important to ask about first and second degree uh, and then when you ask about the first and second degree what age were they diagnosed for example for someone her mother diagnosed at age of 70 is different in the decision making than someone her mother or her sister was diagnosed at age of 49, for example. Um, and even in the absence of positive gene, those patients with family history has twofold increase in risk in the development of breast cancer. Higher risk, but what can we offer them more? Uh, estrogen exposure, it's related to exogenous, endogenous estrogen. Uh, very important you ask in the history, uh, about hormonal replacement therapy. The risk starts typically five years after uh, they started the hormonal replacement. And uh, after they cease the hormonal replacement therapy, the risk goes, ba goes back to normal. And those patients specifically they are, uh, who are in uh, hormonal replacement therapy, they are predisposed to uh, ERPR positive cancer, which is the good cancers. Um, lifestyle option, um, like tobacco smoking, alcohol use, uh, the, uh, and inactivity, obesity, all predisposes you to breast cancer. And history of mental radiation. Now the breast density. Patients with the breast dense actually three times predis uh, predisposed to breast cancer. And in the United States, if you find if a patient was identified through screening program to have a high risk, she is sent a letter that says you are at higher risk of breast cancer. Now, 
the pathological, the high risk lesion. We have the atibia, and those are the surgically, like surgical high risk. Atibia, uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and the LCIS. The genetic uh, syndromes, like the BRCA gene positive patient, uh, BRCA gene 1 and 2, they're 80% predisposed to breast cancer. The B53 mutation, uh, they are 20 of a quarter of them will develop a breast cancer. Very important when you obtain the family history, ob ask about other cancer, uh, like uh, breast, ovarian, aid were they diagnosed, was it bilateral or unilateral, and other cancers, namely colon, prostate, male breast cancer. People think that a uh, male does not develop breast cancer. So we ha even by asking them, them, you are educating them that those patients, there is a subset of patients who are predisposed even in male. And we have the SNPs. It's, the SNPs is newly coming it's into the market, into the uh, clinical practice, which is a single uh, nucleotide polymorphism. These uh, are identified in 5 to 10% of population, and they pre predispose to breast cancer and other cancers. And actually, it's thought to be that 17% of patients with family history that we cannot identify, like non-mutation, is responsible uh, by the SNPs. It's not commercially available yet. They are trying to integ uh, integrate it into different assessment tool, but not yet. This table will show us the risk, uh, the gene positive patient with 80, uh, more than 80 percent, and the classical uh, lobular uh, hyperplasia or the lobular uh, LCIS. They're up to 11 percent at higher risk. ADH and ALH, they're five, uh, five times elevated risk. So those patients with this high risk, they need to be referred to a specialist. They need to be followed up or counseled about their risk. So how do you calculate the patient risk? Classically, the, the model that was uh, identified or that was commonly used, the, it is the one that was used uh, in the clinical trial, in the preventive trials, the risk is if it's more than 1.6, if the calculated risk, if it's more than 1.6, this is a high risk. And she, uh, the patient deserves a high risk counseling. Uh, this model does not integrate extended family history and it does not integrate uh, breast density into it. Uh, this model available online, uh, like an application on your uh, iPhone. So download it and use it. Start using it regularly, and you'll find that we are. You'll find into that you are integrating into your pla uh, practice. The BCS, uh, the breast uh, uh, cancer uh, colostrum. I think they are. They have this tool. It integrates the BIRAD system, and it is available also online. So you can download it. Uh, and it will calculate for your risk. Uh, the other models are less commonly used into practice. Okay, so you have a patient, you did the risk. What are the patients that you will as high risk? Patient with genetic predisposition based on family history, patient with high risk lesion uh, based on surgical pathology, strong family history, patient with calculated Gale model more than 1.6, and patient uh, based on other model, uh, other risk assessment tool to have, have uh, found to have 20, more than 20 to 25 percent risk of development of breast cancer. So you have these patients in your clinic. How do you counsel them? So to advise them to perform breast self-exam. I know that there is a, like a controversies between people that they don't encourage breast cell or they don't think breast self-exam is uh, helpful. In our population, screening is not that common. I highly recommend breast self-exam. The woman need to get accustomed how her breasts feel, and then she will learn to detect uh, if this normal feeling or not abnormal. Uh, annual breast exam starting at age of 25, at age of 20 to 35, uh, 20 to 30, if the thyroid cruise core more, more than 20 to 25. Mainly that is beneficial for patients with positive, surgical high risk. Surgical high risk 
usually do not benefit from MRI screening. Having said that, please calculate the risk and let the specialist to, def to decide upon this. And then uh, mammogram alternating with MRI at age of 50, this uh, 35, uh, after age of 30, this is also for patients with family history a patient whose mother developed a breast cancer, please start, or sister, start 10 years younger than the mother. Uh, this is very important. So if, if a mother develops a cancer at age of 45, start, uh, start at age of 35. If the mother has started at 50, start at 40. So whatever comes first, the age of 40 or the age of 10 years younger. This is very important, but you need only annual mammogram unless MRI indicated because of the family history or the risk assessment tool. So how do we reduce the risk? We have the lifestyle options, which is healthy lifestyle, exercise, diet. I tell my patient, I tend to tell my patient the benefit of leading a healthy lifestyle is far away than just preventing a cancer. It prevents diabetes, ischemic heart disease, hypertension. You get cancer reduction, or theoretically speaking, you get a, a, a cancer reduction as a bonus. Uh, this slide, uh, this is from by Daniel Etal. Daniel Etal used the, uh, the, uh, the uh, risk factor project, uh, assessment project, uh, that was done on nine different uh, practices worldwide. And he used, the, the, this study did not it targeted other diseases like diabetes, hypertension, the project. But then he applied the statistics that he comp uh, obtained from this uh, project, and he calculated the potential, uh, the, uh, the potential uh, fractionable, uh, I think, risk. And found that that these like alcohol, tobacco smoking, inex uh, inactivity are attributed to about 21% of our cancers. Ultimately, uh, fifth of your identify uh, for them a reason could be related to this uh, lifestyle option. So always advise your patient to lead a healthy lifestyle. Uh, to try now. We think that we don't have a problem with the uh, smoking. Actually, shisha is becoming very common in women now, and you have to ask about it in your history. I'm starting to integrate it into my history because women shy away from telling this or volunteering this information. So if you think that you're... And actually, shisha uh, smoking is the custom in like some uh, parts of Saudi Arabia, like in the northern area, some families, it's like a custom for them. So don't think because we are living here, we don't have these problems. Okay, so chemo prevention. Chemo prevention chemo prevention is about using a synthetic or natural chemical that will help you in reducing your risk. There are six, uh, six trials that address this question. The two drugs that were investigated, tamoxifene and uh, letrozole. So the studies that addressed uh, tamoxifene are the, the B1, the IBIS, and the RMH. We can notice that there is difference in the inclusion uh, criteria for these studies. The two studies that found benefit mainly based on uh, risk, uh, based their inclusion criteria on surgical risk and family history. The RMH that did not find any benefit for tamoxifene based their inclusion criteria only in family history. So what you can learn from this, that chemo prevention is mostly helpful for patients with, uh, with surgical high risk. The other drug, uh, the aromatase inhibitor, where it investigated in two trials and found to be uh, beneficial. When uh, in the B2, they investigated, uh, they compared the B, uh, the B1, uh, the the uh, the tamoxifene with the uh, with the roloxifene, and they found that the tamoxifene is superior, far superior for those patients than tamoxifene in the extended follow-up. Initial follow-up showed that they are equal, but extended follow-up showed that uh, tamoxifene is f superior. So, 
the uh, the United States Preventive Service Task Force has uh, released their recommendation that any patient who is older than 35 with higher and defined as a high risk should be offered uh, chemo prevention. Also, then uh, the UK uh, task force has a similar recommendation. Always, uh, we need still clinical trial that com compare tamoxifen to aromatase inhibitor. The other modality for prevention is prophylactic mastectomy. Do we think prophylactic mastectomy help? Uh, and how much it will help? And what is the quality of life? These are the questions that we need to answer. Uh, of course, prophylactic mastectomy could be prophylactic for patients with no cancer or contralateral mastectomy. And today, I'm focusing on patients with, with who did not have cancer. So, that was published, I think, in 2017 in the Cochrane. They included 21 trials. These trials, what are the limitations that all its retrospective uh, data? There is no prospective data on breast uh, and risk reducing surgery. Yes, we decrease the incidence of mortality. There are there is patient satisfaction is high. However, you have to alert the patient that they will have the, you have uh, they should have a reasonable expectation. The overall survival might be improved. It's only three studies, three retrospective studies that address this issue. Uh, so. Yes, it's beneficial, and there is a good quality of life. We don't know how much the benefit will be. Another study that addressed the quality of life for this patient, they are overall satisfied, but they have some uh, unhappiness with the feeling of the breast, the numbness, the complication after surgery. Therefore, when you, when this, when you sit with a patient, you're in a high-risk breast clinic, and we, you sit with a patient, she has to have a reasonable expectation. She needs to learn that she will, it will not be the same. She will have a similar breast, cosmetic-wise, she will have a mount, but the symmetry, the hardness, it won't be the same. Uh, and put, and, uh, now we come to the cost. Do we think they are like lifetime screening or just one surgery and that's it? In Boston, Boston group, what they did is they created a, a model that analyzed the cost from the Medicare system. They analyzed the, uh, the cost for uh, surgery, immediate, uh, immediate reconstruction, uh, sorry, uh, mastectomy with immediate reconstruction, uh, and then the follow-up uh, of screening and the mammals and the biopsies, and they found uh, that there is a cost and a benefit from the prophylactic mastectomy. Uh, there is a my in my, my group have challenged this, and uh, I think their data I couldn't find it online, but I I I, I heard it in some conference that they are eventually equal. So I don't think cost and uh, effectiveness should come into the decision. However, but quality of life and patient expectation is very important. And still there is no, remember that is, this is all based on retrospective, not there is no prospective data that showed that there is a survival benefit. Yes, we decrease the risk of developing breast cancer, but the survival, which is we all always look at, it's not proven. So the, SS, uh, the Surgical Society of Surgical Oncology has released their sp uh, statement and they say, yes, it's beneficial. Uh, no threshold, like uh, about when you do the risk assessment, there is no risk, uh, there is no threshold that you, you say, this patient above this switch, she needs to go for prophylactic mastectomy. The younger the age, the better the outcome. Uh, quality of life should be cons uh, addressed, and m there is good percentage of the benefit is derived from a bilateral salpingioferectomy uh, for these patients who are BRCA gene positive patients. There. So, I looked at our own data here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the studies are limited. Uh, the Gale model was the average Gale model was calculated uh, on, based on 180 Saudi teacher here, and it found to be 0.87 plus 
plus minus five year risk of developing cancer, which is somehow similar to the state data. Uh, there is one uh, retrospective data that showed uh, cohort, retrospective cohort showed that our average age is 47. Most of our patients were overweight. M not a lot, uh, their most uh, minimal number has like nullibara and there is good percentage of them has positive family history. Amudi uh, Tal, she mentioned the case control study that she compared the risk factor. She found our own risk factor. We found that, of course, older. We have all the patients are older. Uh, they have a younger age of menarche. The age of uh, at first term, first full term delivery was not different. History of breastfeeding was protective. Family history was pr uh, was not significantly present in patients. The OCB use was was positive in patients with uh, breast uh, in the cases, and the cases where the BMI was not different between the two age group uh, between the two cohort. Actually, there was a another. Uh, uh, case control study that was done in Eastern province that found that actually patients with breast cancer were thinner than patients with non-cancer. Their study was based on about 20,000 control and I'm not sure what are the, uh, what is the number ca uh, of cases. So this is about our own risk factor. So at your clinic, this is what happened. You get a patient, most of our patients, even the patient with breast cancer, you cannot identify a single breast patient. A patient with like, yes, this is your family. This is why you develop breast cancer. Most of the patients is multifactorial. Most of the patients are at average risk. They are not at higher risk. So how do you deal with these patients? They are coming to your clinic. They are in fear. The media, uh, people are saying, uh, oh, you will not develop. Uh, this fear will create and come. This is where you need to translate your knowledge into patient interaction. Examine the patient, assess her risk factor based on the tools that we have online, uh, based on history and your history and in, uh, interview with the patient. Examine the patient and if patient has asymptomatic, she is at average risk, reassure her. You, no one can predict that this patient, even if high risk patient, you can never still, if uh, BRCA gene, you can never know who will develop breast cancer. Can you modify her risk? Yes. However, can you say yes, you will develop it or no? Just reassure them that she, they did all the precautions that they, uh, they could have. They will, if they live a healthy lifestyle, they will, uh, the benefit from this will add a bonus to breast cancer exercise, uh, reduce their fat intake, soya sauce found to be uh, claimed to be protective in Asian population while it's harmful in uh, like Western population. So reassure them, tell them that they have to live a healthy lifestyle uh, and do the proper thing. Whenever needed, investigate, do their annual mammogram or and clinical breast exam, uh, self-assessment if they are okay with it, self uh, breast self-exam, and that's it. There is no need for this fear. Uh, so I conclude my talk. This is a summary. You need a detailed family history and uh, risk assessment tool. Uh, is needed to identify patient at high risk. Genetic counseling and testing should be offered and you need, and this should be not offered by a specialist, not by you. And it needs to be, you need to learn that even the genetic counsel, even the genetic testing has its own dilemma. So don't get the patient to, into the dilemma of the genetic counseling and the possible outcome, just direct her where to go. Patient need to be ed uh, educated about the possible test results, the decisionary and patient need to be educated and counseled. And remember that there is no right or wrong. Uh, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Lenoir. Our third speaker will talk about screening recommendation and she will talk about the clinical part of the RINAS. Thank you, Dr. Anafis. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today I'm going to talk about uh, breast cancer screening recommendation, clinical examination. So this is our uh, objectives, um, uh, rule of primary care physician in intensive screening, uh, breast self-examination uh, recommendation, and clinical uh, breast exam recommendation. Uh, so uh, Dr. Awafa, uh, thankfully, she go through uh, some epidemiology. And uh, I will, as an introduction, I will go, uh, I will emphasize some of them. So as all of us know that breast cancer is the most frequent cancer among women. It is the greatest number of cancer related this among women. Uh, in 2018, this is WHO, it is estimated that uh, uh, 627,000 women died from breast cancer. What about in Saudi Arabia? Uh, this is, was on 2014. About 1,826 uh, female was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, on the regions, uh, those are the five highest regions. The eastern was the uh, highest one. The median age at diagnosis in Saudi Arabia was 50 years old. So what is the rule of primary care physician in intensive screening? Uh, one of their rules, they have an integral role in the prevention, diagnosis, and management of breast cancer. They are the gatekeepers to healthcare. Um, each woman should have the best access to their uh, uh, primary care physician than any other physician. Patients see their primary care more than any specialist. Uh, the primary care usually have a long-term, trusted, and valued relationship with their patients. Uh, patients rely on their primary care for the advice given them by other specialists and subspecialists. Uh, and primary care must help in examining the breast to be able to rec recognize the abnormalities. They must also be familiar with the risk factors for breast cancer, as Dr. Alul will go through them, how to evaluate breast mass, uh, imaging technique, and when to refer uh, to breast surgeon for further evaluation. Okay. In order to improve breast cancer outcome and sur survival, early detection is critical. And there are two early detection strategies for breast cancer, early diagnosis and screening. What is early diagnosis? Early diagnosis strategies focus on those things, providing timely access to cancer treatment by reducing barriers to care, improving access to reducing the risk of death from the breast cancer. Screening. It consisting of uh, testing women to identify cancer before any symptoms appear. And we, we know the uh, three methods, uh, methods of screening, mammogram, uh, clinical breast 
practice exam and breast self exam. The mammogram, it will be uh, discussed on the second talk, uh, the, its recommendation, but we will go through the second two. Let us continue on screening. Screening required investment. It carries significant potential personal and financial costs. So the decision to proceed with screening should be only after those conditions. Basic breast health service include effective diagnosis and timely treatment are available to entire target group. Its effectiveness has been demonstrated. Resources are available to sustain the program and maintain the quality. So uh, uh, those guidelines, Cochrane Collaboration, Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare, US Preventive Task Force, and Cancer Research in UK, all of them conclude that there was evidence of breast cancer more than in the range of 15 to 32% after screening. So almost all high income countries are having uh, a mammographic screening more, uh, program. Do we need a screening? So some numbers. After 20 years out of 1,000 women who have a screening regularly, 75 will be diagnosed with breast cancer and have a treatment. Out of these 75, 16 will die from breast cancer. 59 will, su will successfully be, be treated and survive breast cancer. Those who have not screened, 58 will be diagnosed. Of these 58 women, 21 will die and 37% will be uh, or 37 will be successfully treated. What this is mean? Every 1,000 women screened, there are five lives saved at the expense of 17 women who will be overdiagnosed. This is lead us to the harms of screening. False positive and overdiagnosis. So false positive, unnecessary follow-up, uh, test and biopsy, and there will be anxiety and psych uh, psychological distress. In studies after two years, there is no clinical diagnosis of depression or anxiety, but still there is some distress. On overdiagnosis, cancer that would never have progressed to clinical importance in absence of screening, of treatment without any benefit. But what about once the cancer is diagnosed, it is a cancer. We couldn't say that this is overdiagnosis. So there is an issue with the overdiagnosis. Some radiation exposure may be small risk with the mammogram. So we will go through our recommendation in breast self exam. What is breast self examination? Uh, it is the inspection of woman's breast on a regular, repetitive pace for the purpose of detecting detecting breast cancer. The U.S. Preventive Task Force, this is their statement. We'll go through some uh, guidelines. So for the U.S. Preventive Task Force, no requirement for clinician to teach women how to perform breast self. This recommendation is based on studies that found that teaching breast self did not reduce breast cancer mortality but instead result in additional imaging procedure and biopsy. Uh, American Academy of Family Physician, uh, they are against clinical teaching women breast self exam. This is the American Cancer Society. They dis does not recommend breast self exam. Uh, but there are some, there, there's some guidelines who are recommending the breast self exam like uh, the uh, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Uh, um, breast self exam of screen breast cancer in women of all age, not used as a single method. And uh, the situation was weak uh, because there 
there is lack of evidence. Um, and they um, recommend if the mammogram is available, this is your screening tool. Uh, breast self exam play a secondary role on those places where there is no mammogram. As we saw, most of the guidelines, they didn't approve uh, breast self exam as a screening method alone. But it should be part of the three steps program of mammogram, clinical uh, uh, breast exam, and breast self exam. This does not close the door to breast self-exam, okay? Um, uh, it just place it in perspective and reinforce proven screening technique. So, those women who are currently doing the breast self-exam um, should not stop. This is a, the, their, uh, their option. If they, they want to continue, they can continue. And those who are not doing it, this is their choice even. Uh, so, simply means that women should not depend on breast self alone or feel, feel guilty if they do not practice a regular self exam. As I said, it is a personal choice, but if the woman will do it, she has to know the benefit, the limitation, and how to do it in a proper way. Not recommended the, uh, the breast self exam doesn't mean that we have not to have awareness. So uh, what is breast self awareness? It is defined as a woman awareness of the normal appearance and feel of her breast. What the guidelines say about the breast self awareness? So US Preventive Task Force, they support all patients being aware of changes in their bodies and discuss it with their clinicians. In American Cancer Society, uh, clinicians should counsel women regarding the importance of being alert to breast changes. So, breast self exam is not it didn't mean that we have not to be aware about the changes in our breast. So, what you will teach your uh, patient: look for a change in the size, shape, or feel of your breast, a new lump or thickening in a breast or armpit. Uh, skin changes such as puckering, dimpling, a rash or redness of the skin, fluid leaking from a nipple in women who isn't pregnant or breastfeed, uh, change in the position of nipple, pain in your breast, but all of those symptoms does not necessarily mean cancer, uh, but any change have to be reported to your doctor. Okay. So this is important. Even if the woman is having mammogram, she should make sure that she know how her breast normally look and feel. Many breast cancer are still found by women themselves rather than screening. Uh, if she notice any unusual changes in her breast, shouldn't wait until the next mammogram. This is on women who are under screening already. Cancers can develop between mammograms, and this is known as interval. Uh, interval cancer mammogram can also miss some cancers so awareness is important uh, going to the recommendation of clinical breast examination what is clinical breast exam is an examination of both breasts performed by trained health professional so recommendation in the u.s preventive task force and american academy the current evidence is insufficient to assess the benefit and harm of clinical breast exam for women aged 40 years and older. What about American Cancer Society? Uh, research has not shown a clear benefit of regular clinical breast exam. In Saudi Arabia, the recommendation uh, a clinical breast by a healthcare professional not to be used as a single method, just like the uh, uh, breast uh, self exam. And uh, whenever mammogram is available, this is the uh, tool of screening. 
and clinical breast exam can be used in those area where there is no mammogram. The Saudi guidelines, does, uh, this recommendation does not go with the routine physical exam. So women who came for routine physical exam, their breasts have to be examined. But the recommendation, I mean, the guidelines is only on, uh, on the screening one, not on the uh, routine physical exam. So what are the intervals of, um, of clinical breast exam? One to three years for asymptomatic average risk women aged 25 to 39 years. The, this is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, guidelines. And every year for those who are 40 years and older. Clinical breast exam alone, the sensitivity is 54% and the specificity is 94%. If the clinical breast exam with the mammogram uh, it had a greater sensitivity than the mammogram alone but a higher false positive results so among 10,000 women screened with the clinical breast exam and mammography there were 55 additional false positive screen for each additional cancer detected by clinical breast exam so each country adopts its own guidelines and there is a statement for the uh, WHO uh, that uh, policies on early cancer detection will differ between countries um, the, um, who, are, who are well developed country they can just go with the mammogram but we couldn't uh, say that mammogram have to be done on those who are low pro uh, prevalence and with weak health care system uh, so uh, the recommendation of early detection uh, go with the awareness and go with the clinical breast exam in those who have uh, no mammogram, uh, mammographic uh, uh, mammogram available. You couldn't just, uh, in some countries it's very costly, so you couldn't just, uh, it couldn't just be like a screening tool. The, on this uh, slide, uh, it's like, um, you know, comparison between the guidelines uh, um, and what they are telling about the breast self-exam, clinical exam, and the mammogram. Uh, maybe your patient will come and say, what if it is cancer? So it's really tough to prepare for the C word, uh, but remember that it is not a death sentence. And with early diagnosis, the chances are very good for those women. So with early breast cancer stage one, 10 years survival over 90%. Advanced breast cancer stage four, 10 years survival less than 10%. Uh, early detection, improved treatment, more women than ever are surviving breast cancer. And thank you. Sorry, they will come. They will come at the end. Selfie session. Do this stuff, please. Another session. Last but uh, not the least, Dr. Abir Al Musa. Dr. Abir is a consultant of women imaging. Uh, she's a consultant at, uh, medica at King Fahad Medical City Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Abir will talk about uh, screening recommendation and she will uh, uh, touch the uh, uh, radiological uh, part. Dr. Abir, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for attending. 
Uh, it's my pleasure here uh, to give you today an idea about the role to give you an idea about the role of radiology in uh, screening for breast cancer. Uh, my colleagues, they talk about the numbers and the percentage, so I will not tell you more about how frequent is the breast cancer, but to know that um, in our society, it's becoming one of the most um, um, cancer in female patients. It counts approximately for 25% of the uh, cancer. <clears throat> and the mean age is, is 50 years between 40 and 60 years old. Uh, here in uh, Saudi Arabia, or I'm talking about in Riyadh especially, we are um, following the ACR recommendation, which is the American College of Radiology. Uh, screening should start at 40, uh, at the age of 40 years, except if there is uh, any risk factor, as my colleague, she um, explained about the risk factors and when we should start the um, screening in early age. Uh, what's the benefit of screening is it's for the early detection to improve the survival rate and the patient's quality of life and the less expensive treatment when the uh, cancer is diagnosed in early stage. Um, our aim also in the screening to identify the high risk lesions, um, which is the uh, atypical hyperplasia, either ductal or, or lobular with our papillary lesions and radial scar. Is it effective, the screening, to reduce the, uh, the mortality? Yes, it is effective. Um, it's effective with um, um, decreasing in the um, breast density because in so the mortality reduction rate is less in younger age group. The survival rate is very good in early stage. Um, as we see, if the cancer is less than uh, three centimeters, the cancer rate is, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the survival rate can reach uh, 85%. Um, we talk about the, um, my colleague, she talked about the high risk woman, so I will not go again, but in high risk women, um, sometimes we start uh, screening with MRI in early age. Um, there are two, uh, two ways, either to do it annual or do one year mammogram and another year as an MRI screening. For screening for breast cancer, breast self mammogram, ultrasound, which is an additional tool, it's not a screening tool. Uh, now we have the uh, automated breast ultrasound. We start using it, or actually they start using it as a screening for young age group. Uh, because of the dense breast, we cannot use mammogram. And the MRI in high-risk patients. In Saudi Arabia and internationally, uh, the standard is the digital screening mammogram, which has a good um, sensitivity and specificity, especially with um, increasing the age due to decreasing in the breast density. Now we are having the digital mammogram, or uh, sorry, tomosynthesis, which is the 3D mammogram. Um, when it starts, um, um, the beginning in the invention, the problem with tomosynthesis was the um, uh, radiation dose. But nowadays, uh, we have no problem with the radiation dose. Um, it's approximately equal to the conventional mammogram with, with high accuracy, especially in the dense breast. One of the study in um, USA, they proved that the um, recall rate was decreased from 12 to 8% using tomosynthesis in the screening mammogram. Um, they proved that there is no difference in the cancer detection rate, but personally, I think there is a difference. There will be a difference in the cancer detection rate. It will improve it, but we, we are in lack for the study. Um, the contrast enhanced MRI, uh, we use it for high risk uh, patients. It's more sensitive, but it's expensive and time consuming. These are the indications for MRI. Uh, it's for high risk patients, as my colleague said, um, they calculate it with the, um, with the programs and um, uh, we can tell if the patient she needs it or not. The other use of MRI is to, to um, evaluate the extent of the disease um, or to uh, screen for recurrence. Mammogram is considered as a sensitive um, 
in a patient again with less dense breast um, above 50 years that it can reach up to 98 um, percent unfortunately below 50 and could be 85 percent due to the dense breast the false negative from mri uh, from uh, mammogram um, is occult breast cancer um, our nightmare is always the lobular cancer because uh, rarely it comes as a true mass. It usually comes as an asymmetry, uh, which needs further assessment um, more than mammogram. And usually lobular cancer is very aggressive cancer. Um, dense breasts, again, it's an, uh, one of the nightmare uh, for the mammogram. Uh, technical issues, um, usually we have good trained uh, mammographer. Um, I will show you some cases where we can miss, sometimes we can miss lesions uh, due to inappropriate technique and error in, in the interpretation due to um, from the radiologist himself. Um, it's always that patients uh, come um, afraid from mammogram due to the, uh, um, um, they are afraid from radiation exposure. The radiation exposure is very, very, very low in mammogram. And we should tell the patient that there should never be, um, uh, should never have mammogram below 40 years old if there is no need. Um, it's never done in pregnant women. Um, again, the false positive results can, read, uh, can lead to unnecessarily additional evaluation and biopsy, anxiety and psychological distress. We face it a lot with the patients. Okay, um, to, uh, to explain, uh, to um, assess the breast cancer screening program, we have uh, some performance assess assess assessment criteria, which are the recall rate, cancer detection rate, specificity, and sensitivity. The most important is recall rate and cancer detection rate. Here, here I am comparing between a few, um, few areas, like in US, the cancer uh, recall rate was 11, and cancer detection rate was uh, five per 1,000. The Canadian, they are also near. The cancer detection is, um, uh, sorry, the recall rate is uh, 9.5 and the cancer detection is uh, approximately seven. In the UK, um, they have very, very low recall rates, can reach up to 2% with, a rate, with a mean of 5% and cancer detection rate of three in 1,000 women. The, in Korea, um, they have very high recall rates can reach up to 20%, and I think this is due to dense breast. Um, however, cancer detection rates reach only three. Okay, in Saudi Arabia, um, I think you heard about the national um, screening program um, delivered by uh, Minister of Health. Um, usually, oh, it started at uh, 2012. Uh, approximately more than 100,000 women uh, were screened. Um, our recall rate in, in approximate numbers was 12%, which is acceptable in comparison to the uh, international. And cancer detection rates was 6%. Uh, I will talk about the uh, screening, uh, um, the screening in Riyadh. We have uh, two uh, fixed uh, clinics, which is the one in Panorama Mall, one in Hayat Mall. We have three mobile clinics, uh, one beside the King Khalid Hospital, one beside the Salam Mall, one uh, beside the Prince Mohammed uh, Hospital. Who is eligible for screening mammogram in Riyadh? Any Saudi lady, more than 40, not pregnant or lactating. She only needs to have her ID, national ID with her or copy from it. Um, usually the workflow for the, uh, if any woman go there, she will meet someone who will take brief history and risk assessment. They will do the mammogram. The mammogram will be sent to the reading station um, where double blind reading will be done. Um, the results will be um, ready for the call center. They will call the patient. Either the result is negative or to be recalled. If recalled, it means she needs additional or breast ultrasound or plus minus biopsy. Um, this is the latest information about the uh, breast cancer screening program. The time between um, 
the screening and the notification, the patient notification about the results was from three to 10 days in absence of technical issues. Uh, we are, we depend about, uh, all of our work depend on the internet. So sometimes we have technical issues and delay the uh, um, sending the images and delay the results. Among the abnormal screening, um, time from abnormal screening to the first diagnosis um, can reach to two weeks. And the time from abnormal screening to the first uh, definite day, to the definite diagnosis is can reach 25 days. Different diagnosis, I mean, we took already by screening. Um, um, as I said, the technical issues, patient education about the breast cancer or breast problems. Um, the patient, they should know that not all recall case is cancer. Um, and they should always also be educated about the biopsy, that um, biopsy does not mean also cancer. They should be also educated that the biopsy does not spread the disease. Um, sometimes we have a uh, few cases where we follow up the, um, the findings and the patient, they don't know why we follow it up. Sometimes they come, no, just tell me, is it benign or malignant? Um, um, yes, uh, there is one uh, issue, patients, when you tell them cancer, they will say, so I will have mastectomy. No. Um, most of the patients, they tell no pain means no cancer, uh, which is wrong. They correlate sometimes the bigger breast size with the more chance of having breast cancer. <clears throat> and they correlate that um, breast cancer can be due to previous trauma. These are few um, few things we face it with uh, with the patients in their real life. Uh, as I told you in the K KFMT, um, we are um, we have some responsibility with the national screening program, and we have also our screening program, which is in collaboration with our um, employee health clinic. We do screening for our staff, female staff, and the staff dependent, depending on the criteria. Do they fit for breast screening or not? Um, we have one day clinic, or sorry, one stop clinic. We do the mammogram, we do ultrasound if needed, and we do the biopsy at the same time if needed. So we do it all in one visit. Okay. Um, I'll just show you some cases where screening is um, our aim to have the, uh, or to reach the diagnosis in this stage. Um, as we see here, it's very small mass. It's only very small mass, few millimeters. Uh, so here we are talking about good survival rate. Um, another case, um, a little bigger, but still considered to be um, small with a good survival rate. Um, this is another case where I told you that the uh, carcinoma is our nightmare because it presents as a total asymmetry only. Um, so we don't have, uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, this one is uh, mass again. Uh, this is the um, WLA cancer. She presents with only total asymmetry, no palpable mass, and no clear mass in, in monogram. Luckily, the patients are uh, having a uh, not very dense breast, so it's not obscured. Uh, we don't want to reach in this stage where the cancer is so obvious, so we have no role for screening. This is another case. Yes, it's bigger mass, but still, because it's in the lower quadrant, sometimes it's difficult to be felt either by breast examination or bicep examination or clinical examination. Here also is the important role for, for uh, mammogram. Uh, when I spoke to you about the technique, as we see here, the cancer almost in the axillary uh, tail. Sometimes, uh, or we face a case where 
the technologist, he didn't pull the press in a good, uh, in a good way to include this area. It's easily family uh, messed. That's why we need to have a good trained mammographer for this training. And this is the task of one. Uh, I didn't bring a lot of microclassifications because it's difficult to be seen, but again, the microclassifications are cases for with um, benefit from screening mammogram and now we are talking about DCIS again and this is another one yes it's a clinical because almost there is skin thickening um, besides the mass um, however the location is a location is in the lower area so it can be felt very late this is our nightmare is the uh, Dense breast. Uh, where mammogram sometimes is very difficult. Uh, so you should look for any second design, like in this one, we have only 10 things. The posterior aspect of the glandular tissue in the right of breast, where there is a big mass. And thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. Now we'll be having like uh, 15 minutes for questions. We do have questions. Yes, please. Anyone has any questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this information. This is one of the questions. When the mission did the following suspect, was based on a suspect, the limit. The second is the time of the scenarios. So what you do is if you have an FNA that is in malignant cells, yeah. usually at that time we should not take the patient to OR to do an excisional biopsy or an excisional biopsy. You try to refer the patient to a place where they have core biopsy. Not available. Not available, then you should, if you have malignant cells, do not an excisional biopsy. You, is it, how big is the mass? Say something. Three centimeters. Like four. Three point four. Oh. Is it only unifocal? Uh, yes. Yeah. There's no other. Can you look at my numbers? Both inside those cells, cystic lesion, Can you do a more? You should do more. More, but you should see the Yeah. Our but, thing about it is, there should be a facility where there should be a core biopsy available. Now, if it, there is not, because this is what happens, a lot of times they're referred yeah. okay, with an FNA of malignant cells, and usually are accepted. Core biopsy is vital because it gives you the additional, should she go for new adjuvant people who will look at the lymph node status, in terms of planning her treatment options. A lot of times when you excise it, it disturbs the, um, even the management in terms of, uh, uh, of how the cosmetic is going to look, sometimes the margins. So if there is no way that you can for this patient to any other center where there is a core biopsy and you only have it in terms of then you should excise it with clear margins like blood factory. I'm uh, doing excision mm -hmm. biopsy, mm -hmm. blood factory. Like mm -hmm. this is your additional if it's split. But that is something I wouldn't recommend. Mm -hmm. I would recommend more mm -hmm. no, 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 no excision. No. So excision. Should excise and with margins, mm -hmm. not even excise mm -hmm. margins. And when you remove it because you're a surgeon. 
we will remove it, you should adequately uh, um, uh, mark your superior margin, your inferior <coughs> margin, the margins all should be adequate. One of the things that we find the problem with is it's taken out, no marking done, and when the final pathology comes out, we don't really know what the margins are. If it's positive, it's closed, if it's very important for radiation or if she needs additional surgery or not. Okay, thank you. Anything to add? <laughs> uh, I think uh, in this at this time, uh, hello. Uh, I think at this time you are. Uh, it's not acceptable to do a You have to learn for uh, without the professional. There is the national this training program. Yeah. You can go and present there. Uh, the, uh, it's not acceptable at all to have a patient with, especially if she's old. And they do a biopsy today. We have the facilities, it's available. Just direct her to where she can go. Now she can go to uh, screening, the screening clinics. She can go. And if she's not accepted in the case of our tertiary care, she may see hospital, they have a good system. They accept as a name. But if, for example, King's Road City, they have a system where by they go to primary health care and they get into the system very quickly. So it's not acceptable at all. And we will not go ahead and try to. You have to try hard. You have always to try hard. You know, as in terms of this terrible management, even the accuracy of your sense is not different if you do accident. Biopsy or incident and biopsy, then if you take the de novo before that she can. Yeah, that's actually should be yeah. yes. for any region that is suspected as cancer. Yes. Unfortunately, you know, you find uh, regions that are officially excited and then you end up missing the whole management. That's actually last from the decides. For breast, but also other any other region. If you have a surgeon and you cut out region, please, please, you want to do it in the but not to get for the breast. Make sure that you assume that this could be a cancer. No cut is in half and then leave something in the body. Uh, but always remember you suspect cancer and you're not ready to do surgery. Please repair any issues. Any other question? If no more, we can, clo can conclude uh, by this and we'll take 15 minutes. Uh, okay, 10.30. Can we make it 10.30?
in the introduction. Uh, I think this initiatives and other uh, workshop in cancer uh, control are, are uh, in, in huge need and uh, I'm happy to participate with you today and in uh, any uh, project in the future with this regards. So when we talk about cancer uh, genetics, uh, I tried as much as uh, possible to make it relevant to you and to make it practical. I'm not going to go into deep details about the molecular pathways or the molecular genetics per se, but we would go over things that is practical and related to primary care physician. So what I'm going to do is go over some basic of cancer genetics, then talk about the role of primary care in cancer genetics. Then we'll go over some of the common inherited cancer predisposition uh, syndromes. So I think this uh, table is relevant for any primary care physician. When we talk about cancer prevention, we are talking about significant impact on cancer incidence. Although these are all estimation, it's in the United States population, but you can see in up to more than 50% of the cases can be reduced if we do a better job in terms of cancer control. And as a primary care physician, I think you are in touch with any of the obesity, hereditary factor, and family history are all relevant to you, and I think you see them on your daily practice. So I think you should do a better job in terms of smoking cessation, encouraging uh, weight loss, and maintaining ideal body weight. And if you have someone with hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome or significant family history, to know what to do with those patients. So this is the summary of the lecture. So all cancer is genetics, but cancer is rarely inherited, sorry. Okay, so we'll go in a bit of detail about this. So if you look, this is, let's say this, the, the, the race car is, is a, a normal cell. It's under control of two things, the tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogen. This is a normal genes in our body. And there is a well balance between these two genes. Now, when there is I would say that tumor suppressor genes are the bricks and the proto-oncogene are the gas. So if you have too much gases, when you have more oncogene that overcome the capacity of the bricks, you will have abnormal growth of the cells. In the opposite, if you lose the bricks and continue to have the gas, also this will lead to abnormal cell growth and proliferation. So this is the whole idea about uh, cancer genetics, although this is just simplified way of saying it. And when we are talking about hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome, we focus about this part because most of mutation happen in this part. These are just example, you don't need to worry about it. This FDG mutation, either oncogene or tumor suppressor gene is associated with certain cancer and syndromes. Now, there are a difference between inherited cancer predisposition syndrome and other genetic syndrome. So if someone born with Down syndrome, he will manifest with Down syndrome. This is not true for cancer genetics. If someone has the gene that predisposed to breast cancer, they need multiple other factors to cause this. So not everyone carrying a gene mutation necessarily means he will develop the cancer. And this brings us to other factors like acquired mutation that happen in, in addition to inherited mutation and the other important environmental and epigenetic factors. So again, if you have a woman with gene, let's say BRCA1 mutation, she's obese, she's a smoker, she's at higher risk of developing breast cancer compared to individual who just carry BRCA mutation without any other risk factor. So it's not only about having the mutation. Now, this is a pretty also uh, basic of cancer genetics, the nuts and hypothesis. So every one of us get one gene from mother and father. So you have two copies of the gene. If you get an abnormal gene to start with from the parent, only what you need is a second hit to the normal gene to have cancer. That's why we see the cancer, the, we see the cancer predisposition at younger age compared to other population. But let's say you're born with the two normal genes, you need somatic mutation to have the first abnormal gene, then you need another many somatic mutation to have two abnormal genes that cause mutation. So somatic mutation is something that we don't uh, inherit this from our parents. It's something happened to our body due to multiple environmental factors. 
what we inherit is the germ line mutation. This is what we talk about. So a few principles about the inherited cancer predisposition syndrome. So when we talk all, take all the cases of cancer in, in, into account, only five to 10% of all these cases are related to mutation. The rest are sporadic and to other risk factor. Now, if you look to breast and colon cancer as a really a common type of cancer, then genetic mutation represent small percentage of them. So if you have in Saudi, for example, 1,500 case of colon cancer per year, we are talking about 100 to 150 of case are related to genetic um, uh, mutation. But on the other hand, if you have a rare tumor, like adrenocortical carcinoma, for example, 30% of them are related to genetic mutation. So these are um, something to consider into uh, to account. Now there is a principle called penetrance. So what do we mean by penetrance is the proportion of patient having the mutation who will express the phenotype, the cancer. So BRCA1 mutation is a high penetrance gene mutation because up to 70% the chance of developing a breast cancer. So this is also something we take into account when we counsel the patient and the difference between uh, high penetrance and low or intermediate penetrance gene. This is also basics of uh, genetics. Most of them are autosomal dominant. So if the sibling had a chance of 50% to inherit the gene mutation if uh, one of the parents uh, is affected, the chromosomal part is really uncommon in, in uh, cancer genetics. So in your clinic as a primary care practitioner, what things will alarm you that there might be something in this patient's family history? So you will find multiple generations affected with certain type or cluster of certain type of cancer. If you see an individual with bilateral tumors, like women with bilateral breast cancer, you, you see someone with multiple primaries, for example, a lady with breast and ovarian cancer. And sometimes there are a benign finding that can indicate a presence of possible underlying germline mutation. So this is what I'm emphasizing on the red flags that in your clinic you, you would take into uh, account. So once you identify those patients or you have a suspicion about cancer predisposition syndrome, your next step is to refer the patient. So you have to be familiar with your, the place where you are working, if this service is available or not, or the other places where this service is available. So you will refer your patient to a genetic clinic, either oncology genetic clinic or to the general genetic clinic. And this is actually what we see mainly in the clinic. So it's mainly related to colon and the breast, and simply because they are the commonest type of cancer we see in, in daily practice. And the rest of, of them are uh, distributed between other type of, uh, of malignancy. Now, <clears throat> the referral to the genetic oncology clinic is not an optimal, even in, in the United States where are there, they have the best uh, clinical cancer genetic program. So uh, these are the cases of cancer patients, they already diagnosed with cancer, and they looked to more than 10,000 patients, and they looked back to their chart, they looked for the documentation of family history, and referral to oncology genetic clinic if indicated. So you can imagine an oncologist who's seeing those patients, who treating patients with breast cancer, and only 50% of patients who should be referred to the genetic testing only referred, and the situation is might be a little worse with, with colon cancer patient. So always, if you have the chance to refer the patient, if you are suspecting, this is, this is important because it has a huge impact on prevention of cancer. So when we see the patient in the clinic, this is what we do first time, either as a medical oncologist or if we have a genetic cancer, this is what we do. We take a proper family history, and this is the most cost effective and the most important step to decide about whether you need to do testing or not. In uh, online, you can, see, you can see many available resources that you can use to estimate the risk of someone to have mutation or cancer risk. But I would alarm you that this should not be taken by, per se without going to the patient detail, family history, and knowing the whole picture of the patient. Because if you see, if this is one patient, and if you use the different scoring system or different risk assessment score, you get a different result. So you don't interpret the result based only on the risk assessment score, but you have to go back to the family history, which I believe is the most important uh, thing to do. Now, once we see them, 
we decide about the next step, which is testing. So in the clinic, we try as much as we can to test the individual affected with cancer, not the other member of family, because as simple as we can miss if someone has no cancer and we test them the negative, this does not mean that they don't have the mutation. So to maximize this, we try our best to examine the patient or test the patient who carries the, who affected with cancer, because this will increase the likelihood of detecting the mutation. So before we, we do the test, we discuss this in detail with our patients. And it's very important to discuss after obtaining a consent, you should have a patient who is more than 18 and tell them about the potential result that he will get. So the first two and the last two are okay because the, the, the things are a, a, bit, a bit straight. So if you have a pathogenic mutation or likely pathogenic, this means this mutation is known to cause cancer, we can do some risk reduction strategies. And if they don't have any pathological uh, mutation or likely not to pathogenic, we can individualize the risk depending on in, in, uh, each scenario. But we have this in, in the middle here, which is called variant of uncertain significance. So this is the most important thing that you talk to your patient before doing the test, because we are doing many genes nowadays and we get abnormal results. But what does this mean? At present time, we don't know. So this might put the patient at daily psychosocial stress if they know that they are carrying mutation that we don't know what is it. But you have to clarify this to your patient. This is number one. And number two, you should not make any major intensive screening reduction based on variant of uncertain significance. Okay. Now, once we get the result, we counsel the patient and we do recommendation. And this is the second part. So the first time you refer the patient to the oncology clinic. And after obtaining the result, we counsel the patient and we come up with recommendation. Now, in other places of the world, this is the important part of the primary care physician who will carry this recommendation and follow the patient. We don't have this system here yet, but until we have that time, you should know that this is really a part of the primary care physician role is trying to follow the screening recommendation and to follow the patient in the clinic regularly. So based on the result, we decide about testing the other member of family. We can do certain risk reduction intervention for those who are cancer free or survivor. And we can use as medical oncologists this for a therapeutic options for those who are carrying the mutation. So here you can see the different risk reduction strategies. So mastectomy, uh, salpingiophorectomy, hysterectomy, colectomy, gastrectomy, these are examples. So as you can see, it's not a simple intervention. And for young and healthy women, it's not a simple procedure you just proceed with without have a solid background that the patient really should go to these procedures. If we cannot offer any preventive or risk reduction uh, strategies, we go to intensive screenings. There are different tools, radiologically, endoscopically, the method, the frequency, it depends on each syndrome. And in certain type of syndromes, we don't have really a good screening modality. So we don't have a good screening for brain tumor related syndrome. We don't have a good screening modality or at least consensus to pancreatic cancer. And it's not a one-man job. As you can see, the ideal team to include different specialties because every one of this touch an important aspect of, of the caring of individual. And remember, many of those individuals are healthy individuals. They are not affected with cancer. So they need a really psychosocial support. They need a really uh, good information and resources to read about these syndromes. So this is in, 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 in general how, how the basic of the cancer genetics and doing the test and getting the result. Now, I think we should touch upon some of the genetic syndromes that you, you might uh, be involved in a way or another to, to see those patients. So again, most cases of breast cancer are sporadic. Familial, when we said word familial, it means there is a family history, but there is no identifiable gene mutation. When we say hereditary, this means there is a genetic mutation that is identified. So there are different gene syndromes here that is associated with this, but BRCA1 and 2 are the commonest. Lifromene also is an important that we will touch also on this. So when we have, when we talk about gene mutation, we talk about risk of cancer associated with that and risk reduction strategies that we do. So, so the one here in green is the BRCA1 and the blue is the brand C, as I discussed in the beginning, the environment are women who 
who as with with years they have a higher higher risk of developing breast breast cancer. So BRCA1 related breast cancer at 30 is not common. It can happen, but it's not common. But age is important risk factor as you can see here. So the risk of breast cancer is more with BRCA1 compared to BRCA2. And as you can see here, it's 50 to 85 percent study on the population they did the study uh, on. Other important cancer associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 is ovarian cancer. So in BRCA1, it's the, the risk reach up to 40 percent. In BRCA2, about 15 percent. Now, when we talk about BRCA2, there are other genes and other risk factors that, that uh, other cancer that can be associated with this, like pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, are also associated with uh, BRCA2. So this is just to summarize interventions that we could do for those populations. So prevention is, is ideal, but as I told you, sometimes because of this intervention happened to young and healthy women, sometimes they, they opted not to go for that. But if in the, the, the evidence base and the most preventive strategy is doing risk reduction surgeries. So for bilateral mastectomy and bilateral salvingeophrectomy. However, sometimes women opted not to, to do that and to go to alternative ways. So intensive screening is another way to go for breast cancer. So women should be uh, counseled to have clinical breast examination. There are different guidelines, but this is at least in general that you can, you can follow. Starting at age of 18, we recommend to start breast MRI at age of 25 and you add mammogram at age of 30. So what we do in our clinic is we do MRI and mammogram, especially if the woman is, is older than 30. And the way that we do it, we do it in alternating way. So if you do a mammogram in six months, you do MRI the next six months. So the process of carcinogenesis in those patients happen quickly. So we don't want to miss them in, in, in between. The other uh, uh, way that to go with women, although it's not evidence uh, uh, based or it's really uh, yield uh, survival benefit is doing transvaginal ultrasound or following them with a tumor marker. Few data about using hormonal therapy. In, in the P1 trial that they looked for the tamoxifen as a preventative strategies for women, only few percentage of those patients were BRCA1. It's, it's really something you can discuss with the patient, but we don't really have a significant evidence to suggest this routine before our patient, especially for BRCA2, because BRCA1 tend to be hormone negative uh, breast cancer. So the other syndromes that you should be aware of is leaf remaining. It's not common, but they have a really high risk of developing cancer. So in their lifetime, their lifetime risk, and what we mean by lifetime, it's if they live up to the age of 70, so they have the chance of 90% to get cancer at their life. And the breast cancer is the huge risk factor here. And what we do in, in our clinic nowadays is we do a whole body MRI annually. And for breast, we need to follow them as we do with patient with uh, BRCA1 and we consider risk reduction surgeries. And if they opted not for to go for surgery, we follow the same with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. So the rest are just for, for your reference as I understand that you will get this information and these slides uh, with you. So just for your information. Now, moving to the second part, colorectal cancer. So again, mo mostly sporadic cases, familial, about 10 to 30 percent and the rest are due to known genetic mutation so lynch syndrome is the commonest three to uh, eight percent of all cases followed by by the rest so the way that uh, I, I try to memorize them so lynch syndrome is, her is also named as hereditary non-peloposis colorectal syndrome actually they can form polyp and when you do the for them uh, surveillance you'll find them they are forming polyp, uh, polyps and Sometimes they develop cancer related to this polyp. So it does, the name does, does not imply the, there is no polyp. The other is depend on the type of polyps that you have. is either adenoma or hamartoma, and are there certain different syndrome under each of them. This is again to show you the, how the uh, presence of gene mutation can pose the risk of individuals. So any one of us has around 6% of risk of developing colon cancer at one time. But this risk can up to reach up to 95% in someone with FAP. And you can reduce this risk, actually. So it's really important to identify those patients. Individuals with Lynch syndrome, they have 70 to 80% uh, colon cancer. 
So Lynch syndrome, it's again, it's like any other patient. It's mostly autosomal dominant. It's our tumor suppressor gene. You don't need to worry about uh, them. But loss of function of any one of these genes lead to colon cancer. There are other cancers that is associated with this. And I put in red the two important things that commonest that happen. So has its own impact in terms of risk reduction, intervention, and screening. And remember, it's a multidisciplinary uh, care for your patient. And by this, I conclude. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. You made cancer uh, and genetics sound very easy. Um, this is actually a very important subject. Genetics is your patients will always ask you for this. So it's good to know that background and how to guide them effectively because we have a lot of misinformation, especially on TV now. 
Um, I, I heard once on TV last week by a woman who said everybody should get cancer genetics and, and uh, be tested for BRCA. And I think that's a very good thing to say to the general population. Anyway, moving on, point of care of oncology resources. I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Mohammed Al Khayyat. He is a research coordinator in King Abdulaziz Medical City, and he will be talking about uh, a very nice uh, project. Hopefully. Project. Okay, okay. assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like to talk about the point of care oncology resources. I think 15 minutes is, you know, slight little bit not enough, but I'll try to go as fast as I can. So as you all know that we are living in the dot-com boom era. So we are always looking, is there an app for that? Is there a website that can provide service or can provide knowledge or information for us regarding this specific topic? So in this presentation, this is the outline for this. This presentation will we'll go for the aim and introduction. Uh, I'll show you some of the available resources and we'll show you one which is, we think it's, it's good one, which is the poker oncology. So the aim of this presentation is to show you some of the available resources, how to find it and how to access it, while how to evaluate the content is, is, is your part of the job. So you have to check to check it. Yes. Uh, is it feasible? Is it doable in our institution or in our center? So this, you know, goes back to you or comes back to you. So in introduction, uh, Internet has uh, is a valuable tool and it is touching everything in our life, nearly everything. And um, in healthcare, Internet is touching the patient, is, is, is nourishing the patient, researchers and clinicians with resources, tool, knowledge, connections, uh, all, all of the other things that you have in mind is available in the Internet. So the NCI, which is the National Cancer Institute, it believed that Internet has revolutionized the communication between the patients and their caregivers. And, and this is something really, really you see it every day in your clinic, where, where your patient goes and, and Google his, his symptoms or his uh, side effects, and he come and talk to you about that one. So in this part of this presentation, I'll show you some of the resources available uh, on the internet. So you can use it, utilize it wisely in your clinic, in your office, to follow it during your practice, or even as, even as educational material for, for you during your practice. The first one, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN, which is an alliance of 27 organizations. They are dedicated toward having uh, good patient care, uh, improving the research and education, uh, providing effective and effective and eff efficiency in cancer care, which will all lead to improve the patient outcome, patient or patient reported outcomes. NCCN they develop a lot of resources. It's not only guideline, but the guideline is one of the most common, the most popular one available online. So this is their homepage. By the way, this is a free website. There is no requirement to have your credit card number or anything. You just go to their website, to their homepage, and you go for this one, which is uh, login or register. This is their website. Then you, if you have, a, you have, if you have a, a, an account, you just tap it. You just go to the register for an account. You fill all of the required field, and you have instant access to all of the resources. So once you do your account, which I'll try to show you in a minute, you'll have access to all of these hyperlinks. And here it says guideline, insist and guideline for detection, prevention, and risk prevention, risk reduction. All that you have to do is just to click it. So once you click that part, you'll see all of these hyperlinks and, uh, uh, within that category. Let me show you. For the uh, detection, prevention, and risk reduction, you'll find resources for breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal, lung cancer, and prostate cancer. You click any of these things, and you'll see the list of the resources included within. So, for example, let's talk about you know the most not saying complicated, but the most you know well understood maybe uh, cancer. So we'll see that there's multi resources available under. So there is, for example. Uh, basic resources, core resources, and enhanced resources. All of these are PDF, and there's also the NCCN guideline, which is the, mo the most comprehensive or holistic one. So what is the difference between these categories, basic, core, and enhanced? When you say basic resources, it means that this guideline is providing you with the essential services that you should do for your patient. You cannot skip it. These are the very basic resources or uh, tests that you have to do your to your patient. While we, when we're talking about the core resources, it includes the basic resources and additional services, which is uh, that provide major improvement in the disease outcome, which, and it's not costly. 
So, uh, yani it includes the previous the previous part, which is basic resources and the, and and additional information. While when you go for uh, enhanced resources, you can see that in, it, it includes both of the pre previously mentioned uh, categories or parts, and there is an additional services that provide lesser improvement in disease outcome or services that provide major improvement in the disease outcome, but they are costly somehow or relatively. And the last one, which is the most comprehensive or holistic one, which is uh, the NCCN guideline, which is uh, an evidence-based consensus-driven uh, recommendation made by the NCCN guideline panels. This one, it includes everything mentioned previously. In addition to that, it includes additional services that provide minor improvement in the disease outcome, intervention that are cost prohibitive and uh, lower resources or and, and services that do not provide improvement for the disease outcome, but they are desirable by the patient or by the health institution. So in summary, just to have it in, in one graph, if you go to the breast cancer guideline, you'll find all of these things. These are the major three, breast cancer reduction, breast cancer screening and diagnosis, and genetic familial high risk assessment, breast cancer and ovarian. For these, for this category, or for this category, you can find that there is the basic one, there is uh, the core resource one, there is the enhanced one, and there is the holistic one, which include all of the previously mentioned or, or shown uh, guidelines. So, as you can see, once you click the PDF, it's uh, it's interactive PDF. It's a clickable, full with hyperlinks. You just click the part that you'd like to to see, to visit, or to read about it and it will move you directly to that part specifically. So you don't have to search or, or, or to read it all. You go specifically to the part you need. Uh, other than the NCCN, there are other hospitals or other resources available online, such as the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We all know this, uh, uh, this organization is, is, is working for the contagious disease or epidemic and these things, but they have also screening tool for some cancer, such as breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. And, and they have a list of other cancers listed in their website that says, we believe that screening for this cancer will not improve the outcome, will, will not reduce the number of death, but these are the guidelines for screening. And they categorize the screening based on the scientific evidence they have. For example, if I may click this one. Okay. The beauty of this website is that it will show you guidelines from multiple resources here and it will show you the summary for each specific age group for each of your patients. So you can read it. You can go with each, gu each guideline you'd like to, or it's feasible or doable in, in your institution. In your institution. Uh, okay. The third resource, which is the Electronic Preventive Services Selector. The Department of Health and Human Services, in collaboration with the Agency of Healthcare Research and Equality, they made a US Preventive Task Force, which is a uh, a panel of experts in their field trying to, to put resources to prevent diseases in general, not only cancer. So they came up with one application, which is very, very, very good for primary uh, care clinicians that enables you to find the specific uh, guideline that you should follow for your patient specifically. Let, let me show you. So this is their website. You go to their website as you as you can see it's uh, it's available on android ipad any other any other uh, application or any other uh, software so we'll go with the web one because we'll use it in, in the browser so for example i say i have my patient who's 55 years old who's a male and yes he's a smoker and he's not active show me the recommendation Okay, maybe maybe it's blocked due to uh, network issues here, but I'll, I'll show you how you can use, how you can get the benefit of this website. You can go to any of these categories. For example, you go for tools. Oh. Oh, it's not clickable. I think it, it's closed by the by the network here in Faisal. Anyway, 
you can you can I have some screenshots so I can show you okay so you go for for example uh, uh, for for tools for example and you click it then you press ctrl f to find any other uh, related word so you press ctrl f then you, you write cancer and you press enter as you can see i don't know if it's if it's clearly shown here we we will have 57 resources available for cancer patients so you can click any of these things and it will take you directly to the uh, resource that you should use whether if it's guideline whether if it's fact sheet uh, patient information uh, anything related to, to the to the cancer itself and if you go for the other part which is browse by topic you can you can say i need the tools for cancer which is for prevention or which is for uh, for example for uh, screening and it will take you directly to that tool so the first the fourth resources available online which is the calculators many many calculators available online to to calculate many things for cancer patients some of it is from trusted websites or agencies some of, of it is not so I'll show you this one. I hope it's working. This is provided by the NCN, where you put the information of your patient. I think Dr. Lulwari showed some of these things. Uh, where you click it, you, bit, you put specific information about your patient, and it will give you personalized data or personalized result for your case, or for that, for that case, about uh, the uh, occurrence or about the, the risk, risk assessment for this, for this patient specifically. Over the internet, there is a lot of published literature, and it is updated almost daily, and uh, it's available in many databases, online, uh, in different format, and it's it's giving a really huge benefit to the clinician in their clinics. So as you can see, these are some of the samples available on the internet for specific diseases. Let me, at this point, give you an inter conclusion and a hint. Internet is full of resources. Internet is like your biggest USB ever, but you have to know how to search it and where to find what you need immediately and in, in, in like time manner. Uh, if the uh, uh, hyperlink worked in, in, the, in the previous slides, you, you, you'll be exposed to more than 70 hyperlink in this presentation by itself alone. More than 70 hyperlinks, especially from the, uh, uh, the, the application which, which we showed. The problem is you know, you'll not be able to, un to, to categorize, to memorize, to have full access, instant access to these websites once, once you need it in the clinic. So organizing, stratifying, updating these internet resources in a specific categories and making it available for clinicians at their fingertips is a great idea. And that was the basic idea for poker oncology, which is point of care oncology resources or point of care resources for oncology. So in this website, we are, we are hoping to, to, to be a comprehensive hub for all of the avail available resources online where we categorize it in a specific way and you come only to this website and you find all whatever you need. It's not about cancer prevention or cancer screening. It starts from prevention, diagnosis, staging, management, and everything else, even clinical trials for that patient or for that disease, specific disease. After that, we expanded the scope of this website to make sure that it includes uh, services resources or social, so, so social services resources so, such as uh, community resources, Zahra for breast cancer, uh, any other so social or society uh, task force or, or team who's willing to serve cancer patients. We also added part for the upcoming oncology events to make sure that once you'd like to know more about anything related to oncology events, meeting, um, discussions, you just go to this website. We are also providing specific information per disease for the patient and for the caregiver or the physicians to be available on the clinic. All what they need to do is just to access it and print it. So we hope this, this website will, will make it easier to arrange all of the resources available online. So what's good about this website? It's not a one-man job, not, not one team job even. This is, this is a holistic collaborative work where all of the visitors, they have the chance to uh, add resources, report resources, to say, I think you are missing something in this part in the screening for the cancer, for breast cancer, for example, and I have this link, please add it. So we will add it immediately. And uh, because these are links, and links, you know, usually they do change, you know, they, they change the, uh, the address. So anyone who, who's using the website and he has any of the malfunctioning links, he can just report it immediately and we'll take it off or we'll, we'll replace it or update it. So let me take you to the website itself, and I hope it's working because this is... Okay, this is the website. So once you go to the, to the pokeroncology.com, it will ask you, are you a patient? or healthcare professional. 
So you go for healthcare professional. That's thinking. So and why he's asking you whether if you are a patient or healthcare provi provider, because it will give you specific resources for you. So if you are a patient, there is no need to know about surgical procedures from doctor's perspective. But if you are a physician, you should know it from all of them, and you should know it in more depth or, or detail. This is a security issue due to the, to the network, which is a highly secured network, but I think they are working on it. Okay, it, it, it seems I have to talk it from my head. Okay, once you look, once you look to the resources. Maybe if everyone has that, probably everybody has a smartphone. Yes. No problem. Let me see. That's a good idea. So if everyone has a smartphone, you can actually go to the site now and then... Now it's working, good, but it's a slow. As you can see, there are specific categories. So the essential thing for you is to go for the cl clinical resources. For example, I'm seeing breast cancer patients, so I just click breast cancer. In this, in this part, I'll see all the resources for breast cancer specifically. Starting from the NCCN guideline, prevention, resources, screening, pathology, available clinical trial treatment option. For example, I'm looking for something for the prevention, so I just click it. We have all of these available resources for prevention. So you click any of these and it will take you directly to that, uh, to that, to that uh, uh, resource. Okay, this one, it gives you an explanation about the link which you are going to visit. You click it and now you are in the NCCN guideline for that specific item that you you was looking for, which is the genetic familiar or something like that. Mm, all of the resources available here are daily updated. Uh, we are trying to keep it functioning links because this is really very hard job with, with the amount of the links we have in, the, in this website. So that's why we seek contribution from other parties or other, other uh, practitioners in, in, the, in the community. I'll show you one more thing and I think I'll be done by that if it worked. Okay. For the upcoming events, you only click here and you see all of the upcoming events listed in, in a timely manner. And if you have an event that you would like to, to advertise on our website, you just fill some specific information and we'll have it in our website as soon as possible. And, and, and that all is free, you know, free of charge, just, just to spread the knowledge. For uh, Service resources will be listing all of the available resources in the community under this tab. So, for example, you are seeing a patient for prevention and uh, you, you think she's a breast, she might be a breast cancer patient and she needs psychological support. You come to this tab, you go for uh, organization, you'll find organization by, divided by city, country, city, and their contact number. You say that, okay, I need Zahra. So you'll find Zahra. Riyadh, you go and, and you check the specific resource or community resource for your patient specifically. You can join us here. Uh, I'm avoiding avoiding to click because it's taking too much time to load the page. That's why. Join us. You just click it. Put some information: your name, your professional, and where are you from or, or, or living right now. And that's it. And we'll be updating you regarding any field or updates within your uh, specialty in a timely manner. And we hope that you visit this website. You contribute in making it, you know, widely uh, available and nourished with resources for everybody else for you and everybody else, by the way. And uh, this is the presentation. I, I, I truly apologize for the technical issue, but I hope I give something about the uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to invite all the speakers uh, to come. Uh, uh, Sir Hamid, for questions. Because I have some questions. Mm -hmm.